And I just grabbed the girl's hands and we were running and there's a body and another oh. body and another body. And all of a sudden, the SWAT guys come in with big machine guns and start yelling at us, going, get down, get down. This is a crazed lunatic full of hate. It was an act of pure evil. We're angry, we're grieving, we're confused. People are hurting. It was a cowardly, despicable act. It's such a, a tragedy to lose human life like this. These are these are the people who are our family. We're so distraught and broken hearted right now. The American spirit cannot and will not ever be broken. It is Tuesday, October 3rd, and this is a Fox News alert. Armed with an arsenal to kill and no apparent motive, police are now trying to enter the mind of a madman who carried out a killing spree on the Las Vegas Strip. That's right. New information emerging overnight as we begin to see the faces of the victims. 59 now dead. More than 500 people were wounded. A President Trump condemning the attack as an act of pure evil, planning to meet with victims and first responders tomorrow. That's right, but uh, through the images of the horror and the heartbreak in all of this, our stories of courage as average Americans became heroes, risking their lives to, stay, to save strangers. We have live Fox News team coverage for you, beginning with Adam Housley. He is live for us once again in Las Vegas with the very latest on the investigation. Good morning, Adam. Good morning. Yes, the numbers now, uh, 59 is the death toll. 528 injured. Those numbers still can fluctuate uh, at this hour. Uh, the investigation all still, also still ongoing. Behind me in the distance is still a bit dark uh, at the crime scene. And just more than 24 hours ago, of course, that's where the shooting took place. Uh, there are still investigators inside. There are still siren, or I should say, flashing lights inside. Uh, the entire area here in Las Vegas is still shut down for uh, anybody who wants to try and come in this direction as this investigation moves forward. We're also getting more idea about those who help so many people. While we have 59 dead here and over 530, almost 530 injured, many of them were hearing stories of survival, uh, people sticking their thumbs into wounds to make sure bleeding stopped. And that has been noted so many times, including by the Clark County Commissioner, about how well the first responders, uh, how fast they got here and how well they did in saving those lives. Take a listen. And I'd like to ask you, next time you see one of our first responders, whether it be Metro or it be fire or what have you, tell them thank you because uh, we owe them an eternal debt of gratitude for what they did. We owe them an eternal debt of gratitude. We also owe just random people an eternal debt of gratitude. When you walk around town here, what we had a chance to do a little bit today, we got some downtime and we bumped in, at least we bumped into several people uh, who told stories of someone getting shot next to them and, and helping them to a car to get them to a hospital. Uh, there was a story of a woman who was taken by a, a retired army medic, put her, didn't even know who she was, grabbed her off the ground, threw her in her car, his car, drove her to the hospital, saved her life. Uh, one story after another, as we hear more about this madman, this man who who, is, who acquired quite an arsenal. And that, of course, is where this investigation goes from here. Heather, we give it back to you. It, it's, it's eerie to go in and buy a piece of pizza and have somebody tell you, be safe. You just mm. don't hear that in Las Vegas. Back to you. I mean, Adam, the stories that you were able to bring us yesterday, uh, they will definitely just continue to grow as we hear these uh, heroes, these everyday people who just became heroes Absolutely. during all this. Thank you. All right, Adam, thanks. Authorities now digging through this cold-blooded killer's home, packed with explosives and guns, quite an arsenal he had, as the search for a motive in all of this does intensify. And people wanting to know why his family's criminal-plagued past is now emerging. Uh, could it possibly help authorities piece together what led to this massacre? Well, Julian Milley picks up our team coverage from Mesquite, Nevada. That's about 90 miles from the scene of this shooting. Julian. And just to give you a lay of the land, this is a really beautiful kind of quiet retirement community. People say sometimes during the day you see residents driving around in their golf carts. So just to paint the picture for you, we are right now uh, at the houses behind me. You can see over my shoulder. That's Stephen Paddock's house, 64-year-old Stephen Paddock's house. It's kind of at the edge of a cul-de-sac, a small cul-de-sac. So there's only about four houses on this cul-de-sac. So if you hear people saying we really didn't know him, that's why, because there's not many other homes in this area. But 
I want to point out to you here, you can see over my shoulder the garage. You'll notice it's boarded up. That's how authorities entered. That's how SWAT, uh, SWAT entered yesterday when they needed to get into his home. Once they were inside the home, after putting about a two block radius in this neighborhood, they found 19 guns. They found ammunition. They found explosives. A lot of neighbors shocked, a lot of people shocked by this, including his own brother. Listen. We're shocked, horrified, completely dumbfounded I know you're... about this. There's nothing. No, you know, not that that. Not but... an avid gun guy at all. The fact that he had those kind of weapons is just. Where the hell did he get automatic weapons? He's not, he has no military background or anything like that. No religious affiliation, no political affiliation, no, he, he just hung out. Now, a couple of minutes ago, you guys mentioned his family's criminal past, specifically his father. His father, back in the 60s and 70s, was a bank robber, was on the FBI's most wanted list. So there are a lot of things that authorities are looking into right now. His past, his family's past. Stephen himself doesn't have a criminal record. He has a traffic citation from years ago, but that's pretty much it. So at this point, authorities are going through the evidence they found in this home yesterday, including his computer. Back to you. Okay, Jillian, right. thanks so much. All right, well, the killer uh, was not on the radar of law enforcement. This has been a bit of a mystery at this mm -hmm. point. So what comes next for investigators who are now trying to piece together exactly why this happened, what the motive was? Yeah, as Jillian just said, just a traffic ticket. Uh, here now to weigh in is Army veteran and former NYPD officer Dr. Darren Porcher. Always appreciate it when you are here with us. Always appreciate coming. Yeah. I mean, as we were just discussing, this is, has a long way to go in this investigation. Where do they begin? Well, this is an arduous process. Yeah. We're looking at a crime scene that encompasses 59 plus people that were killed coupled with over 500 people that are injured just for uh, just going back to my days of an investigator one homicide can take some time and so when you have this many people shot this many bullets Every single shell casing needs to be extracted from that crime scene. We need to map this crime. We need to map out what happened from beginning to end. We're going to look at when this person first entered the Mandalay Bay. Granted, he checked in on the 28th of September. However, we're going to look back further than that to see the days that he came in and out of that hotel to see who he interacted with. We're also going to look to the additional casinos that he, he gambled in because this person, my understanding, was a known gambler. Right. So we want to create a, a prototype of what this, what happened, what type of person this is, and what the FBI and the LA, uh, excuse me, and the Las Vegas PD are going to do is they're going to reconstruct this crime scene. It takes a lot of time. We need to we need to block off as much space as possible because the crime scene needs to be as large as possible. Yeah. But this is a, a, a weird situation, a weird dynamic. Mandalay Bay is a place that people go to to vacation quite frequently. Right. So how are the, the police department, how are they going to separate the, uh, the recreational right. piece coupled with the investigative piece yeah. is going to be a very complicated and, and arduous 22, process. And we had 22,000 some people there at the scene of the festival itself. I mean, you're, you've yeah. got a lot of people kind of trampling right. over and it as you, well. you got to figure the FBI and the Las Vegas PD are going to look to extract as much video yeah. from these people as possible. And another thing about Las Vegas, Las Vegas is probably one of the most videotaped places on the face of this earth mm -hmm. next to New York City. So all of that video needs to be extracted. Another thing that we want to take in consideration is the computer. Most people think whenever you delete something on a computer, it's gone. However, mm -hmm. the FBI has the capability of extracting that information even after it's been deleted to see what, in fact, this person was up to. So obviously there's a, there's a lot to learn about the, the gentleman, uh, and, and I think that's, that's clear that there's a lot more to know. Uh, the early indication indications are he wasn't religious, that he didn't have any big political beliefs, uh, which are the first two things that, you know, people I think think of when this happens. There was some speculation that there might have been gambling debts that led to this, that, that you know, he might have been in financial troubles, but, you know, it, it almost seemed more to me that it was a guy that had money, that knew he was about to do something and probably was about to die, that was like, you know, I might as well just go out in a blaze of glory and spend all my money first. Do you think there's something right now that, that investigators are clearly missing 
there's got to be something to this, right? I mean, that's what's, I think, driving people crazy is that we have no answer, that there's no why right now, and we're 24 hours later. This case is an enigma. When I reflect on my experience as an investigator, one of the, there are some type of, there's, there's a state of acrimony that's in place. With this guy, as you mentioned, Rob, we're going to look at, they're going to look at his gambling past, but he was independently wealthy. Yeah. He had numerous properties that he owned. Therefore, fin finances weren't the issue here. He had a significant other. However, that, that significant other has since been contacted in Tokyo. So we don't know if there was a split there. We don't know yeah. what triggered this person's reaction and what he did. Yeah. When I look at one of the um, the gun, uh, I want to say the the uh, the gun store owners, he mentioned that look, this guy wasn't in no way, shape, or form was he on the radar as someone that was a, a suspected normal. crazy person. Seemed totally exactly. Normal. All right, well, Darren, a lot more to figure out, and it's going to be a complicated investigation. So thank you so much for coming on this morning and trying to clear some of it up for us. We Thank you so much. This is just right. the beginning. Yeah, Lots absolutely. of different scenes. Have to talk to that uh, roommate slash partner yeah. in Tokyo as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Darren, thanks. Well, as the search for answers continues, the names and the stories of the Las Vegas victims, they're beginning to emerge. 24 of the 59 killed have been identified, but as many as a dozen others are still in critical condition this morning. Yeah, hundreds of people waiting up to six hours to donate blood at three locations in or near Las Vegas. Some even lining up in the middle of the night just hours after the shooting. A GoFundMe page has been set up to support the victims and their families with thousands of donors raising nearly $3 million, and and they did that in less than 24 hours. That's really something else. Well, in the midst of the tragedy, we're beginning to learn stories of heroism and compassion coming out of America's uh, most recent deadly massacre. Yeah, 29-year-old Sonny Melton, for example, who was a registered nurse from Tennessee, was one of the first victims named and identified. He died while selflessly protecting his wife from the barrage of gunshots. And Taylor Benj, who survived the shooting, says his sister jumped on top of him when the bullets started to fly. My sister, you know, being as noble as she is, she actually threw herself on top of me and was saying, I love you, Taylor, I love you. And uh, I'll never forget that. And then there was the off-duty off Arizona firefighter, Kurt Fowler, who was shot in the leg as he raced to shield his wife from the bullets. Fowler was seriously injured and had to undergo surgery. Well, the time now is about 12 minutes after the top of the hour. And the Open Air Country Music Festival, the true definition of a soft target. We've talked a lot about this. So how do you protect people at events like this? And even can you? Our next guest, terror preparedness expert Aaron Cohen, says it can be done. And he explains how. Coming up. Well, the Route 91 Music Festival has been described as the perfect soft target as the shooter from an elevated position shot down into a crowd of thousands of unsuspecting people. Well, it could have actually happened to anyone. So is it possible to keep people safe from these types of attacks and these types of venues? Here now to weigh in is a former member of Israel's uh, Special Operations Counterterrorist Unit, Aaron Cohen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. Uh, so we talked a little bit about this yesterday. I mean, the, this open area, you have 22,000 or so people there. Uh, you have this gunman from an area above where everybody basically is just a sitting target. How do you even begin to protect people in a situation like this? Well, here's the plain truth, and people aren't going to like this, but uh, the truth in security when it comes to counterterror or when it comes to protecting soft targets is often harsh. Um, had bags been checked at that hotel, uh, weapons would have been found. And it sounds to me like there was dozens of weapons uh, total, uh, uh, or half a dozen up in the hotel or a dozen up in the hotel. Uh, uh, the FBI, the investigators, a little tight-lipped right now uh, about the exact number, but the fact mm -hmm. is you have to put those weapons into a bag in order to quietly sneak them into the hotel to get them up into the room to set up these turrets, if you will, that that's apparently the gunman used to be able to fire out the windows. So really simple bag checks would have prevented him from getting into the actual hotel, 
with the firearms and the ammunition. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple. And it's not something that has to be done every day. And people are going to come back at me on this one, and I'm going to, I can already see it. There's 12,000, 16,000 people that go into these hotels daily. It's impossible. It's not impossible. Yeah. You increase those, the security those, those guns were legal, as though, these events right? actualize. Th th those guns were all legal. I mean, I, 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 I just couldn't he just say, oh, I, I went to a gun show, I just bought all these? Or, I mean, I don't know. I mean, th this, those firearms were well, legal sure, in they, the state of Nevada. That's a good point, and and Nevada does have a, a very you know pro gun gun laws, and, and the Second Amendment is taken very seriously there. And there's no question that you can move around mm -hmm. the state. There's shooting competitions that go on uh, almost every weekend, and there's Shot Show, which happens there once a year, which is the largest you know firearms convention. And but here's the thing: you are going to get a permit that comes with that gun. You are probably going to have a concealed carry license that comes with that gun. You're going to have the paperwork on the gun, uh, just like a Class Three uh, um, automatic weapons permit holder would have there's there's a weapon or a license that comes with that police officers carry credential we carry IDs have the paperwork for your weapon let us check it at the hotel if you're carrying those guns legally and if they're legal there's no yeah. problem ha and that guy right there he though had modified some of them though he had modified at least two of them to make them a fully automatic weapon as well so there were reports about yeah that. there's there's I, I I've heard I've heard that as well mm -hmm. and, and again yeah. here's the thing um, th there needs to be a little bit of behavioral profile training that goes into the security apparatus. Look, people have been talking about Vegas and being a target. I think we have a responsibility to honor the victims of this massacre, to prevent future attacks, and to learn what we can from this event, which is you have a large crowd of people here. You have this hotel, which is looking over and where the shots are coming from the fourth floor, the 24th floor, the 32nd floor, wherever they were coming from. The fact is, had bags been checked before people went in? And again, those bag checks can happen. When you have a large event like this, you add the additional security. It's really simple. I'm not trying to turn this country into a police state. Nobody is. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm known to be tough with my, with my point of view. And the reason why is because I was trained in Israel. Um, one of the other things that I highly recommend is the, uh, is the use or the exploitation of off-duty police officers. And we had a lot of them at this event. In fact, uh, uh, I believe a number of them were killed Couple tragically. Yeah. Off-duty, yeah. yes, or shot. Well, off-duty police are a critical force multiplier, guys, in Israel. And what that means is every off-duty officer is required to carry his weapon, but is encouraged to become part of the first response <laughs> protocol. Let me give yeah. you an example. Well, hey, I hey, used this before and I pulled this up. I, I, hate, I hate to interrupt you, but we, we are going to run out of time and no actually worries. go to black yeah. here in just a second. But we, we certainly understand uh, who better to, to, to know how to secure something than uh, than the Israelis who, who deal with a lot of this kind yeah. of an issue and are certainly masters of, of, of that trade. Yeah. So thank you so much, Aaron, for coming Aaron, on. Just want to share what we can. Just no, want to yeah. share what we can with the community. We appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. And he's right about this first thank responders. You guys. Yeah. Well, the time now is about 20 minutes after the top of the hour. And the Vegas massacre is sending shockwaves through the country music industry. All our love to the victims, to the victims' families. All right, Carly Shimkus has more from Garth Brooks. That's coming up next. So sad to hear this news yesterday. One of my favorites, legendary rocker Tom Petty, has died. He was rushed to a Los Angeles hospital after being found unconscious inside his Malibu home after a heart attack. He was put on life support, and then late last night, he passed away. A memorial growing for Petty right now on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and online tributes are pouring in. Listen to this, singer Kid Rock tweeting this, uh, just when I thought today could not get any worse. R.I.P. Tom Petty, thank you for your beautiful music and inspiration. And then Paul McCartney also tweeting this, sending love to Tom Petty and his family at this difficult time. Petty was 66 years old. And it was a really, really rough Monday, as yeah, Kid Rock said. Not, not at all. All right, country music's biggest stars now coming together to offer prayers for victims and their families as news of Sunday night shooting continues to shock the world. Yeah, Carly Shimkus with Fox News Headlines 24-7, Sirius XM 115 is here now with their heartwarming responses to the unspeakable tragedy. Carly? Yeah, good morning, Heather and Rob. You know, this tragedy has absolutely rocked the country music community. Just last night, I heard Big Kenny of Big and Rich tell Martha McCallum that these victims feel like his family, his country music family, which is why so many musicians have responded. Uh, let's start things off with this emotional Facebook video from Garth Brooks. Character, 
flows uh, in country music, all our love to the victims, to the victims' families, all our love to the band and crews. Um, tough. Yeah, now the Route 91 Country Music Festival has become a popular venue since 2014. Little Big Town took to Twitter writing, one year ago we played Route 91 on Sunday night. Our prayers are with all the first responders, artists, crew, and mostly the country fans. Blake Shelton tweeted, my deepest sympathies and prayers to anyone who has been affected by the Las Vegas shooting last night. I don't even know anymore why. And Toby Keith posted this somber tweet, God be with the music lovers and the music makers in Vegas last night take time to pray. Sentiments I think we are all echoing today. Robin Heather, back to you. Yeah. All right, Carly, thank you so much. Thank you, Carly. Well, the time now is 26 minutes after the top of the hour, and explosives and guns found inside the shooter's home. Our law enforcement panel is here to break down how he was able to fly under the radar and could this have been prevented. Also, Sarah Huckabee Sanders breaking down inside the briefing room in the White House. Our coverage of the Las Vegas massacre continues next. The memory of those who displayed the ultimate expression of love in the midst of an unimaginable act of hate will never fade. Their examples will serve as an eternal reminder that the American spirit cannot and will not ever be broken. like you were in a war zone. We just expected that we were going to get shot. As we believe Paddock is solely responsible for this heinous act. We're shocked, horrified. Where the hell did he get automatic weapons? I would not want to wish it upon anybody to see what we saw. is a horrible, horrible, horrible uh, moment in my life, but um, we were able to take care of people. People are now dead. More than 500 more injured. Yeah, we have live Fox News team coverage beginning with Adam Housley live on the ground in Las Vegas there at the scene. Adam. Yeah, guys, you know, more than 24 hours later, there's still a very intense investigation going here, and they're still in a very intense hunt for some of the victims. We've, I've just sitting here the last hour, I've got a number of emails and, and text messages, and I've gone online, and you can see the number of people that are still trying to find loved ones, which indicates to you again that this investigation is still going behind me. The lights are still on here. Are you, uh, if you look over the fence from our location, you can see that there are investigators inside. They're they brought in some extra lighting as well, so they're using the lighting that was. There for the festival as well as extra lighting to continue the investigation and we do know that there have been bodies that have not yet been identified which may explain why some families have not yet found their loved ones uh, we also know there's some people in the hospital who have not yet been their families not yet been contacted uh, so those those are when you have that those numbers that makes it more difficult also when we're going back and hearing about the people that saw and witnessed some of this stuff take a listen again to some of the things we heard last night were you carrying people? Yeah. Yeah. We both were. As long as they weren't, you know, right. gone. Understood. You were trying to help whoever you yeah. could that, that needed help. Yeah, we're just trying to get people out. That's all that matters. You do what you can. You do what you can. I mean, we're all together, red, white, blue, whatever. You know, you try and help each other. So I just I pray that they, uh, you know, they made it out and whoever did this is uh, neutralized. And in about 30 minutes, guys, as we give it back to you, we have some exclusive video that we're going to show you of what that inside of that hotel room looked like just one year ago, the night before, on the same exact night, one year ago, another family was here celebrating and going to this festival, and they took some video of the room that was eventually used one year later for this horrific uh, scene. So we'll, we'll show it to you guys in the next half an hour. That will be very interesting. Adam, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Right. Well, the weapons cache uncovered a dark family history as well. So how did the gunman in the deadliest shooting in American history slide under the radar of law enforcement? For more insight, let's bring in our law enforcement panel, former member of the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force, Steve Rogers, former CIA covert operations officer, Mike Baker, and former D.C. police detective, Ted Williams. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank so you. I will start with you, Ted. Um, this massive amount of weapons that we're talking about, like 23 inside the hotel room itself, another 19 inside the Nevada home. How did he manage to fly under the radar for so long? Because he just didn't fit the profile. 
Uh, you know, I have covered for Fox News the Pulse nightclub uh, shooting, uh, Virginia Tech shooting, San Bernardino. All of those cases, we had a profile. This guy was just John Q. Normal American citizen, a millionaire living out in the, living his life a certain way. He was an accountant, never gotten into any trouble with law enforcement, no digital fingerprint. This guy is someone that law enforcement is going to study for many, mm -hmm. many years because he just didn't fit the profile. Yeah, Mike, John Q. Public until he wasn't, which was yesterday. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, people are I, I think a lot of people, maybe not those that are you know used to dealing with firearms, are shocked or stunned at the number of weapons that he had. I mean, collectively and also was able to carry into the hotel. But, you know, there's there's, there's not a mechanism that, that, you know, triggers the authorities and says, look, someone's bought, you know, X number of weapons over a period of time. So maybe that warrants a visit or, uh, you know, further ins inspection or investigation. Uh, and as far as carrying those weapons into the hotel, uh, I know people are, are sort of uh, amazed at that ability, but think about it. There's no metal detectors. There's no bag search going into the hotel. It's not like your airport. And the ability to break down these platforms and, and pack them, whether he carried them in a mm -hmm. golf bag or carried them in, in, in bags, it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily, once you sit and think about it, and the level of detail and planning that he put into this overall operation, it's not surprising. Yeah, it's amazing, Steve. You know, he'd been in the hotel room itself until uh, since the 28th. We're being told there were like 10 to 12 um, suitcases that he carried all of these weapons in, uh, ammunition as well. There were explosive devices located, ammonium nitrate in his car. Uh, what do we need to do to keep someone from, you know, flying under the radar again? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that we have to beef up security in a lot of these venues now. And look, there's no reason why, especially after an incident like this, that there cannot be any checks of uh, baggage in hotels. I think that's going to be a game changer. Uh, it takes a few minutes to open up a bag and to look in it. But, but what amazes me is, did uh, anyone in that hotel see him carrying these uh, big weapons in? I mean, we're talking about long rifles, and they were so complacent, they decided, well, we're not going to say anything about it. But as we pointed out earlier, you know, Ted, I'll go back to you. A lot of these weapons, they were legal. All these weapons, actually. He, he had a right to have them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he did. He uh, converted, uh, apparently, some of these weapons into automatic weapons. I don't think, though, that we're going to be able to micromanage, unfortunately, hotels. You uh, uh, and how he got these weapons in, certainly he could break these weapons down and bring them in over mm -hmm. a period of time. They're going to have to check the videos. They're going to do a lot of video fingerprinting or backprinting to try to determine over a period of time how he bought in all of these weapons. He may not have bought them in all at one time. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely the, the working theory at this point. Um, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your insight this morning, and uh, a lot of questions remain to be answered. Thank you. Well, the time now is about 20 minutes until the top of the hour, and the motive behind the worst mass shooting in American history is still a mystery. What could have caused this millionaire gambler to snap that up next? Welcome back. Shock and grief pouring in from all across the nation, including a moment of silence at the White House following the deadly shooting in Las Vegas. But just hours after the attack, Democratic lawmakers are already beginning their push for stricter gun control laws. Ellison Barber joins us live in Washington with more on that. Ellison. Good morning to you guys. President Trump is headed to Las Vegas tomorrow. The sheriff there says he spoke to the president yesterday and Trump is expected to meet with him in person come Wednesday. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders choked up as she spoke about the bravery of law enforcement and regular people when bullets started to replace the sound of country music. The memory of those who displayed the ultimate expression of love in the midst of an unimaginable act of hate will never fade. The president called the attack an act of pure evil. We feel such great anger at the senseless murder of our fellow citizens. 
It is our love that defines us today and always will forever. But he did not speak about terrorism and he did not mention gun control. On Capitol Hill, Democrats said thoughts and prayers are simply not enough. We need a president who recognizes that we have a gun violence problem and will work towards solutions. Americans need more than our president's prayers. We need his plans. The nation's counting on you. Before heading to Las Vegas, the president and first lady are heading to Puerto Rico today to see the damage caused by Hurricane Maria. Critics have said the federal response there has been inadequate. Heather, Rob. Okay, Ellison, thanks. thanks so much. From Puerto Rico, he'll go to Las Vegas tomorrow. And the shooter's own brother uh, in this uh, tragedy says he saw no indication that Stephen Paddock was going to carry out such a violent and calculated attack. So is it possible for somebody who's relatively normal to just snap? And are there signs to look out for? And board-certified psychiatrist Dr. Dominic Sportelli is here to help us try to get inside the mind of a madman. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Yeah, uh, it seems like a very difficult task to do, but uh, can you possibly explain what you think could have led to this yeah. in terms of his mental state? Well, so in forensic psychiatry, what we're doing is trying to understand the mind of a criminal, okay? In this case, however, we're working backwards. We're putting puzzle pieces together backwards, and we don't have the subject to interview. It makes it pretty difficult, because now what we're doing is we're relying on all collateral sources, family, friends, acquaintances, employers, things like that, to really figure out who this guy was. Unfortunately, people that tend to be a little bit reclusive and a little bit internal and isolated are hard to figure out. So. There's common simplicity in, in, well, let me just put it this way. Sometimes people oversimplify these circumstances and they say, you know what, this, this was most likely a major mental illness, schizophrenia, uh, you know, bipolar disorder. But here's the facts. Major mental illness very rarely plays a part in mass homicide. What does play a part, however, though, that's very important to understand is personality traits. What I mean by that, when you look at mass homicide, what you see is a theme in a narcissistic type personality. What psychiatrists call this, psychologists call this, is malignant narcissism or pathological narcissism. People like this tend to have this sense of entitlement, a desire for notoriety, okay? Mm -hmm. They have this desire for admiration in some way. They have this grandiosity about their personality. And here's the thing. If you have a narcissistic personality, there's something called narcissistic injury. And you take things very, very personally. And guess how you, guess how you resolve that? Violence yeah. and revenge. That makes sense. Right? Yeah. It, it, this whole, you know, I mean, it, it, the thing is, is, as we got deeper into this thing and there was no apparent motive, and I think it frustrated everybody, um, the first thing I thought was, you know, maybe he was just simply suicidal. Maybe he wanted to die, and I think the latest fad is now, if you're going to die, you don't die alone. You take out as many people as you can. I mean, do you think it could have been simply that he was just losing the will to live? It could be, but just remember this. Unfortunately, suicide's a tragic thing, and, and people yeah. do commit suicide on a daily basis. But this was so far beyond that. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was someone that had a motive to make a point, to do something so extreme, and to have this notoriety behind him. And to actually planned it for plan a while. It. it was not an impulsive act. I mean, we see this. This took time to plan. He had to take the guns to the location. So, so you think just for notoriety, he would kill 59 people and shoot 500 more, pump that much to make a point of some I, 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 I can't even imagine. Whether it's revenge, notoriety, admiration, to make a point in some way. Remember that narcissistic personality is a very powerful, powerful right. thing. Very dangerous, too. That what about so some, some of the things we have learned about him? We do know that he was a high-stakes gambler. Yeah. Um, we know that he had some sort of relationship with this woman, Mary mm -hmm. Lou, who is now apparently in Tokyo. Either one of those things a clue for you? Well, you never know. Look, I mean, high-stakes gambling, 
gambling. These people do have this sort of uh, addictive type personality, a personality that chases a high, a personality that mm. chases a dopamine rush, winning tens of thousands of dollars, which he bragged about in right. some stories, right? So that does point to a personality that might be a little bit unstable, right? right? The other thing is the relationships in his life. I've read some uh, documentation that he was kind of reclusive. His yeah. neighbors in, in, in his community said that he kind of stayed to himself. Didn't have a lot of contact with his Didn't family. Didn't have a lot of contact his with his family. Yeah. Um, some people even commented that the people that did see inside his house, it kind of looked like a freshman in college. It was very just unkempt. And so these are all small personality traits that we're seeing that we really need to analyze. Unfortunately, a lot of pieces to the puzzle are missing and we don't have him to interview. Right.